Hot off the Honor 7 launch across the world, parent company Huawei has just unwrapped the larger and not too dissimilar Mate S with a 5.5-inch 1080p AMOLED display with 2.5D glass. Think the curved edges of many top-end Lumias. Unique is the use of a force touch sensor for extra ways to control your smartphone. Think press in and drag, for example. There's a fingerprint sensor on the back, similar to the Honor 7s, and it's all powered by an in-house Kirin 935 chipset and 3GB of RAM. Unfortunately, Huawei has gone down the iPhone Galaxy S6 route of sealed storage at 32 and 64 gigabytes. The camera is 13 megapixels with OIS and an f over 2.0 aperture. The Mate S will also feel crazily thin. It goes down to 2.5 millimeters on the sides. We'll be cutting cheese with these things next. Sony is back. There's a new Xperia, the Z5, plus a compact version. There's the usual 5.2-inch screen plus 4.6 inches for the compact. The Z5 is 1080p, the compact 720, so no change so far. The Z5 has a hopefully now cool Snapdragon 810 inside, with 3GB of RAM on the bigger model and 2GB on the compact. Both models have 32GB of storage plus microSD, will run Android 5.1.1 and launch, and have a new 23 megapixel f over 2.0 multi aspect sensored camera with phase detection autofocus, though no OIS sadly, so you'll have to make do with digital stabilization. Elsewhere, the power button now doubles as a fingerprint sensor and the battery is smaller at 2900 and 2700 milliamp hours respectively than the Z3s, but the use of memory in display technology means that the power drain is kept to a minimum, all the while screen content is static. And throwing a curveball into the mix is a new ultra-high-tech Z5 variant, the Premium. This shares most of the specs of the other two Z5s, but adds a 4K resolution screen at 806 ppi. 806 pixels per inch. Yes, you heard that right. Now, what did Steve Jobs define Retina as again? Oh yes, 300 pixels per inch. Anything over that is a waste, according to the experts. And I believe him. <laughs> or maybe my eyes are too old to see differences anymore. Anyway... The Xperia Z5 Premium has a stainless steel frame, unlike the other Z5s, which are made of aluminium, and it too is fully dust and waterproof. Lenovo, and yes, they do own Motorola, but still, have launched the Vibe P series, the P1 and P1M. The P stands for power. Both handsets have big batteries and the ability to charge up other devices. The P1 has a 5,000 mAh battery, promising up to 81 hours of battery life. Even the charger is rated at 24 watts. <laughs> a physical switch, the one key power saver, activates a low power mode that doubles the endurance. The P1 has an aluminium body and a 5.5 inch 1080p IPS display. There's a fingerprint reader in the home key, but it's otherwise relatively mid range, using a Snapdragon 615 chipset with 2GB of RAM and a 13 megapixel camera with phase detection autofocus. There's a smaller version, the P1M2, with a 5 inch 720p screen, a 4000 mAh battery, uh, it also has a lesser processor and is all plastic. ZTE, the ODM behind the wildly good value Vodafone Smart Ultra 6 that I loved, have their own first party hardware too. The Axon Elite will sell in Europe through eBay, crazily enough, but is worth seeking out. There's a 5.5 inch 1080p screen and a Snapdragon 810 chipset with thermal dissipation technology antimicrobial gorilla glass, a dual camera setup with HTC One M8 like depth effects rated at 13 megapixels with f over 1.8 aperture, threefold biometric security including fingerprint, voice and eye scanning and dual audio chipsets, whatever they might turn out to be. Now what on earth would compel any self-respecting smartphone fan to pay £400 for a 4.7 inch 720p screen Snapdragon 410 powered phone in late 2015. This. This is the best music phone in the history of the industry, potentially. A dedicated Wolfson sound card, twin headphone jacks, analogish volume control, and some of the loudest and definitely most high quality stereo front facing phone speakers I've ever heard. Of course. That may not matter much to you. Not everyone's a music lover or needs loudspeakers. Plus, both quality and volume are quite good enough on most smartphones these days. But if the demonstration just now grabs you, the fact that you can play back lossless FLAC files and with everything at higher quality, the presence of the stereo high amplitude microphones, Nokia style for music recording, then maybe the Marshall London is worth seeking out anyway.
After all, the London is still a capable Android smartphone thanks to two gigabytes of RAM and 16 gig plus micro SD. Think Moto G third generation, which I reviewed a couple of phone shows ago, though that was in the order of £200, which means you're paying an extra £200 for all the audio goodies, of which more later. <laughs> though, as with the iPhone, there's a kind of a heavy branding premium here. Now, I'm a Marshall fan, having played guitar through a big Marshall amp for years. Let's see shed music online. So the grippy black rubberized plastic fits in perfectly with the theme. Plus there's the brass detailing on the controls and jacks and the Marshall logo to top it all off. There's even a suitable slogan scrawled on the replaceable 2500 milliamp hour battery. Plus you also get Marshall mode in-ear headphones included. So that's 50 pounds back from the purchase price effectively. The twin headphone sockets are an interesting unique selling point Though I'm really not sure how many people would use them outside of perhaps a studio, a music business setting. The volume control does work across both jacks by default, but you can tweak individual volumes from the supplied M button volume interface, all accessed by the brass button on the top of the phone. The software, as on the Moto G, is essentially stock Android plus some extras. One of these is the aforementioned system audio controller. Uh, plus there's also Equalizer Plus to handle all your music by default. You can crank up Google Play Music manually, but this doesn't integrate as well. In fact, the phone lets you play from Google Play Music and from Equalizer Plus at the same time, which sounds horrible. Oops. In terms of recording software, there's a basic but high quality gadget accessed by the Marshall controller game, which batches up snippets of your ideas and then you save as required. Potentially very useful for users on the move to record their ideas. Loopstack is a four channel recorder that allows you to layer a set number of measures of ideas and then see how they sound together. But the app is a bit quirky in the extreme. Ted and I had all sorts of problems trying to get it to work reliably. Both the Marshall recording gadget and Loopstack do offer high quality 16 bit 44 kilohertz recording and processing though, which is good to see. In my test, the high amplitude, either loud stuff, didn't distort at all. Though I did find a few glitches in the process which required a restart. I'm sure Marshall are still working through some of the bugs. Elsewhere, there are no real surprises or other unique selling points. An eight megapixel rear camera is distinctly average. Here are a few samples, plus there's 1080p video recording. One nice touch is that you can press in the volume scroll wheel to launch the camera app from anywhere, including with the screen off. There's also a double tap to wake, though as usual with many Android phones these days, from a deep sleep, this just doesn't work first time, so you have to repeat the gesture. As with the Moto G 3rd Gen, with which this shares quite a few specs, the Snapdragon 410 chipset inside is fussy about SD card support, and you'll almost certainly have to reformat your cards in the phone itself, which is a real pain. However, as a music-focused, audio-centric smartphone, the Marshall London is clearly out on its own, and it's reasonably sized, if not reasonably priced. The true phone size phone, clearly. The 720p resolution matches a 4.7 inch display, even if none of the computing internals are anywhere near top spec. The London is an absolute pleasure to hold and use, thanks to the finish and the size and the branding and everything. But in terms of raw value for money, then questions do have to be asked, if I'm honest. The speakers, the sound card and so on are perhaps worth a £100 premium, if I'm being generous, but that still leaves another £100 for the Marshall brand name and for the kudos you may or may not get from your peers as you're seen using this. It's Apple and the iPhone all over again, only this time in gig-ready black, rubberized plastic rather than white and aluminium. I'm not sure, therefore, that I can give the Marshall London a wholehearted recommendation at least in terms of value. However, the Phone Show Chat podcast, Ted, has fallen in love with his. It's true, I have. <laughs> Is it? Check out Ted's thoughts each week on the show. In the meantime, I'll play you out with the Marshall London doing what it does best. Nice Fade out to black. Crank it up to 11.